I sat in my office this morning and I wrote 21 Bible verses with little inserts about how to change your mindset commentary. But then I looked at my phone and I had uh, notes that I took. I asked Kelsey Lane a question Wednesday and I said, if you could have and change anything in your life right now, what would it be? What do you think people think when they say, if you could have anything right now, and I wrote down exactly what she said, what would you want God to do for you right now? You, right now, what would you want? They'll go away. You pray them away, young lady. Anybody? What would you want? Peace? Health? Finances? Love? Who said love? Anybody interested in love? Call 1-800-JOSEPH. <laughs> this is what Kelsey said she wanted more than anything from God Wednesday night. Asked, are you content? What would you want? She said, take away all the mental torment, all of the sickness, and everything that bad has happened in my life. That was her one, one wish. Was it for her or for her kids? It was to take everything bad and my mental torment away from me. So I thought about what to do this morning. And uh, that touched me then, and it touches me now. So for you and all the new viewers from iTube 247, all the viewers from Saddle Up on AIM Christian and AIM Country Television that are tuning in right now, um, you're going to get a little history lesson of me. How about that? Raised in North Carolina, born. Foster Homes was one of the free lunch program kids that got bullied all the time for being poor. My outlet was I could throw a baseball, hit a baseball, and shoot a basketball and dribble a basketball just about better than anybody. It's because that's all I had. Couldn't go home, you get beat up by a drunk. Used to sneak out of my bedroom window by putting cinder blocks on the outside of my windowsill so that I could climb out and lock my door from the inside. Went on to be a successful business and a CEO of a company. Went on to pro wrestling at the same time. Was fairly successful with that as well. Got sent away for a couple, well, three years in prison. While I was in prison, I was sexually assaulted, beat up, head shaven, and I was thrown on death row as protective custody. I literally lived on death row. Nine months. I got treated like a death row inmate. John Fullen came into my office this morning and asked me a Bible question. And he said, hey, I don't know the Bible well enough to go out and, and preach to people to help them. And I said, you don't have to know it word for word, John. You just have to know it. And I said, most of the people, you know, the stoners and the people in prison, those guys know the Bible really well because that's all they do, right? This is the closest I got to God in prison. I had a guard that would sneak me in tobacco, but he wouldn't sneak me in the rolling papers for some reason. So we tore up Bible paper and rolled our cigarettes that way. That's the closest I got to God in prison. And to this day, I'm thankful for that because I'm not one of those ones that found God there for all the wrong reasons, knowing that when I got out, I was never going to use it. When I got out, God called me. I started with, with my wife now, Cindy, beautiful wife, Cynthia. We started with nothing. And you guys know the story about that. We fished, and what we caught, we ate. If we didn't catch anything, we didn't eat. That, those are true stories. Flat out true. I am singularly the last person that you would ever think that God would put their hands on and say, I choose you. I choose you. I want you to go evangelize to the world. I want you to change the world. One person at a time, one church at a time. I should be so resentful 
for what God put me through the first 60 years of my life to, to today. I know you're thinking, I look 35, thank you, it's 60. Um, I should be one of those people telling you he doesn't exist. I should be one of those people saying it's for nothing. Just go live your life and do what you want to do and have fun doing it. But God touched me. And I heard God tell me to call him. And I dropped everything on that calling. And I told God that day, I know I've, I've talked to Austin about this a lot and other people. I told God that day, I wasn't going to be a good evangelist. I was going to be the best. I, I don't do things to be second best. Sec I've got a mindset within myself that second best makes you the first loser. I don't like losing. That's a competitive nature. If Jesus was here right now, I would probably be as competitive of a human being as I could be to try to get more people to his own cross than he does. Because I just have that competitive spirit in me. And God knew that. God knew that I was going to pursue whatever I wanted, how I wanted, and reach the finish line like the Apostle said, Paul said. He said, this is a long race. This is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. You're in this for the wrong haul. So I'll just say this to the people that don't believe in God. I'm living proof that there is a God. I'm living proof that you can go from death row to a penthouse in the sky. I'm living proof that other people's opinion of me don't mean nothing to me. Absolute, if people are calling people about me, talking about me, writing about me, the only thing you're doing is wasting those minutes of your life thinking you're getting to me. Because guess what? Newsflash, you're not. You're not. Because I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. I'm covered by God. And I know where the outcome is going to be. The outcome is going to be greatness. Because God says so. Amen? I just wanted to say that today. Now we're going to go into the sermon. How about that? Have you ever felt stuck in your thinking that you're unable to break free from negative or unhelpful patterns? Like, you're, you're definitely and certainly not alone. I just told you my story. We all find ourselves trapped in, in our minds from time to time that we're not worthy, we're not good enough. Um, you know, why me sitting on the pity pot? You know, just, just giving it to ourselves, all the negatives that's around us. But what if you were told that the, re, the, the, the key to re reprogramming your thoughts can be found in the oldest, most timeless book there is called the Bible. What if I told you that for everything that is going on in your life negative right now, there's a cure for it in the oldest book there is? What if I told you that no matter what you're going through in your life right now, there's hope. There is a ray of sunshine at the end of the tunnel. There is that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. What if I told you that that's true? Some of you would believe me because you know me. Others and the people out there on, in television right now are probably going, what, what, what's he talking about? I'll tell you. I'm going to explore with you right now Bible verses that set your mind on changing your mindset. If you can change your mindset into better, you can be better. If you can change, look, I know women and men that on a Friday night at five o'clock, they'll take a shower, shave. The men, not well, I do know women that probably need to shave too. They'll, they'll go home, they'll take their shower, they'll put on their nicest clothes, they'll brush their teeth really nice, put the little white strips on it, peel them off, comb their hair, blow dry it, curl it, like Charlie does, and uh, <clears throat> chest hairs, not head hairs. And um, they'll curl it, put on their nicest clothes they have, and they will go to a bar, and they will chase that man or woman to the end of the the earth that they think they want. They will do everything that they can in their power. When they meet them, they'll blow up the phone. They'll show up at their house. They'll constantly trying to whine and dine them and doing all this. What if you tried to whine and dine God? What if you took all that energy that you took for man or woman to get noticed, what if you put all of that energy into getting in a relationship with God? What if you did? What would happen? You'd probably get signed to a record deal. Romans 12.2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
Now, this verse challenges us to resist society's norms that don't align with God's teaching. Instead, by refreshing our perspective and embracing a God-centered mindset, we enable ourselves to discern His divine plan for us. Amen? This transformation from worldly to spiritually thinking signifies a radical change in your mind, empowering you to live in alignment with God's perfect will. And you're going, well, what if I don't like what God's will is? <laughs> Select the alternative and see how you like that. You better have ice cubes, Speedos, and good tanning oil. You know? If you want to live a certain way, live it. But understand the consequences of living that way. How difficult is it to put one's self aside? How difficult is it not to worry about what, oh, he's the town drunk, she's the town drunk, she's the town prostitute, he's the... Who cares what they say? It's not their life. It's not their soul. It's not their goals to get to the kingdom of heaven. It's yours. God doesn't care who you were yesterday. God cares who you want to be today. God cares about you fulfilling an agreement with God. God cares about you doing a covenant with God. God cares about you changing your life to not just better yourself, but to better the people around you. You are no good to anybody if you don't start with you first. So get over what people think. Get over what people say about you. Get over what your past was. Who cares? If you're hanging around somebody that cares, go find a new friend. Go find a new husband or wife or a new something because if they're bringing you down and sending you to hell, that's your fault. That's not God's fault. That's you for being so self-centered on you that you're not willing to take up the cross and get your butt away from the people that are burning your butt in hell. Amen? Change who you're with. Change your mindset. Do the right thing, but do it because you know that's what God wants for you. Not man. Not your husband. Not your wife. What God wants. How ignorant are we to think that our way is better than God's? Amen? Philippians 4.8 Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is white, whatever is pure, right? Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about what is praiseworthy. In this verse, the Apostle Paul outlines a set of virtues that should be the focus of our thoughts. By shifting our mindsets to dwell on the positive and the noble qualities we can cultivate, cultivate uh, be more optimistic, be more spiritual, and be more victorious mentally. Nobody can break your mental mold but you. You allow it. If you're depressed all the time, you are allowing that. If you're sitting on the pity pot all the time, you are allowing that. If things in your life aren't going the way that you want them to go, you are allowing that. God has given us many outs in the Bible. Many times, God has said, take comfort in me. I'm your rock. I'm your shield. I will give you courage, but you need to be courageous in yourself. You need to believe in yourself. You can change who you were 10 seconds ago. If you choose to, if you don't, there are words for that. Some of them I can't say I'm a pastor. The ones I can are narcissist, egomaniac, non-humble, care only about you. Nothing around you matters but you, 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 you. And nothing matters about him, 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 him. But remember this, you don't sit on the throne. He does. You don't judge me. He does. You're not going to decide whether I go to heaven or hell. He does. Newsflash, you, you lose. He wins. I'm in glory. See how that works? Amen. All right. We have got to figure out how we can do a and fulfill 
a God-pleasing life. Guys, it's really easy. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Live your life to God. <laughs> I said this twice in a sermon. People can't believe I say it. I'm going to say it again. It's up to, the, again, I, I just don't care. It's up to us as parents to keep the girls off the poles, keep the crack pipe out of the guy's mouth. That's our job. That's us. We're responsible for that. But we're also responsible to him. So anything and everything that we can do to please him, we have to do. That means surrender yourself to the mercy of God. Give everything you got to God. If you're in pain, give it to God. If you're mentally distraught, give it to God. If you're a little crybaby all the time over, oh, my life is a give it to God. Put it at the foot of the cross and humble yourself. This life, I want everybody to think about something. Charlie, you may have to get an old photo album to think this far back, but think about your childhood, right? If you look at something that you really loved in your child, about, for me, it seems like yesterday I was coaching my kids in Little League. He's 41 years old today, my, old, my not today, but last April. He's 41 years old. But in my mind, I can just still envision me teaching him how to throw and hit and run and, and you know, do the double play correctly, right? If you think in your mind of something that you really enjoyed in your childhood or raising your children, doesn't it seem like just yesterday? That's how life is. It's going to go by that quick. And then you're going to go, what happened? Guys, you happened. You happened to decide that what you wanted was more valuable than that cross and what he did for it. You've decided that other people's opinion of you was more important than what God's opinion of you is. There is no glory in that. There's only self-satisfaction on earth. There is no self-satisfaction after death. Amen? Ephesians 4.22-24 you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God, a true righteous and holiness. This is the Apostle Paul again. And he's urging us to discard our old self characterized by deceitful desires and adopt a fresh attitude. What attitude? An attitude that involves a transformative change of our mindset, embodying righteousness and holiness, similar to what God calls us to do. It's a potent call to foster a change from within for your spiritual growth and the spiritual growth of everyone around you. But again, it starts with you. It says mindset. This scripture and the scripture before says change your mindset. It's not new. It's biblical. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. It's been read by billions and billions of people. But the fact is, not a billions and billions of people don't live like that. They want to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, have a little smirk on their face all day, be sad, and then blame everybody else for the problems. Newsflash, people. God's not your problem. God's your solution. You're your problem. And if you don't think you're your problem, call 1-800-I-NEED-HELP. Or call 1-800-GOD. You know how to get a hold of God right now? Get on your knees. He'll accept the call. He'll take your call right now. And if you are like King David was, if you pray to God with a pure heart, wanting that forgiveness, you got it. Because God gives willingly. He doesn't discriminate, not by age, not by sex, not by religious preference, not by where you live, whether you're in a mansion or you're in a little tiny home and it has to move every so often because you don't own the land. God doesn't discriminate against that. He just wants you to do what's right, and then he will bless you. He'll bless your effort. He'll bless your courage, and then you'll know the power of God. Amen. Proverbs 4.23.
Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I've said this a million times. Your tongue is Satan's greatest weapons. Now it's your tongue and your fingers on a typewriter. Your heart, Billy Graham preached this from 1940s all the way to his death. Your heart is the most, your mind is the most deceiving thing that you have. Your heart can say one thing and your mind is trying to tell you something else. That's called lust. That's called that narcissist thing in your body. That's that ego thing in your body again. If your heart is pure, make sure that your heart is purifying your mind and your tongue when it comes out of your mouth. If your heart is pure, your whole body will follow that pure heart. But you have to allow that. To allow that means you have to be willing to change. And to change, it means you've got to lay your former self in front of the cross, and you've got to ask God. You know, God, this, this, this crucifixion, I get it. I get that this crucifixion was to justify your name, to sanctify everything that Christ went through. And it was so that I could get justified and I could get sanctified. I could get crucified with Christ. I could live by that with that blood of those stripes. I could live by the blood that came down Calvary because that blood is still crying out from that hill today. You just don't listen. Whose phone is that? Let me have it. I'll answer it for you. <laughs> Uncle Jeff. Hey, Uncle Jeff. How you doing, buddy? Um, he, he's in church. This is Pastor John. How you feeling? You know, we've been praying for you a lot up here. All right, man. You want? Um, is it important? I'll give the phone back, and John, John can talk. Yeah. All right. All right. We we can wait till after church. All right, man. God bless you, brother. Bye bye. Uh, he said to call him after church. <laughs> Anybody else want to make a phone call? <laughs> Thanks, John. 2 Corinthians 10.5 We demolish arguments at every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This verse underscores the importance of subduing thoughts that contradict God's knowledge. It signifies the importance of developing a mindset that's in obedience to God's Son. Surrendering every thought and every practice to His authority in a world full of conflicting ideologies. Ensuring our thoughts align with Christ teaches us to remain rooted in faith. If we want to re remain rooted in faith, we have got to believe everything. We've got to believe from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. We have got to believe that if God, if you're blessed enough that God speaks to you, live and act upon what God is telling you. If we are blessed enough to hear His Son speak to us, you have got to soak that in. Listen to that. Implement it on a daily basis. Live that life. Don't be a 23 and a half day Christian. They're not in heaven. You can't be a part-time Christian. You either are or you're not. That is dependent on you. You ever heard that expression, you can't be a part-time thug? You can't be a part-time Christian either. You either support and live by the concepts and the principles of God's Word and His Son, or you don't. That's 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, this year 366 days a year. If you want to change the world, if you want to better your life, if you want to make life better for you and your family, your children to be help, happy, healthy, and, and, and prosper, you have got to make that commitment and that change within your life right now today. You can't wait anymore. God's tired of waiting. Don't you see the picture on the wall with everything that's going on around you and in the world? God is tired of waiting. He wants it now. So who here, by show of hands, wants to give it to God today? Looks like everybody. See, okay, thanks, I did my job. See you later. 1 Peter 113. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ has revealed this 
at His coming. Peter, in this message, urges us to maintain a sober and alert mindset. It's about mentally and spiritually preparing, focusing our hope on the grace that comes through His Son. It signifies a mental shift towards anticipation and readiness. There's a difference. You have to prepare to be ready. You understand that? You can't go to school and take a math test and think that you're going to ace it if you never studied it. Study the Word of God. Listen to God speak. Listen to His Son speak. And when they do, you're ready for the test. Until then, you're not. You're lazy. You're a coward thinking that you can do it without God. You can't. You can live your life according to your rules, according to the way you want, and you can, dis you can disregard God all that you want. But you're going to get God. You're going to get God. God will find that little cheat sheet that you're using. God will know that you went to the Bible for Dummies page and tried to just cram real quick. You can't do that. You can't get faith by being a dummy. You get faith by relying on a holy God. You get faith by relying on a holy Son. You get faith by listening and acting. Are you willing to listen, to act, to change, to succeed, to see the work be accomplished in your life? That's up to you. I can preach this until I lose my voice, and I have before. But it doesn't mean you're going to listen to me. That's up to you. I'll do my part. I'm just asking you to do your part. Amen? 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. Power, love, and self-discipline. This verse reminds us that fear doesn't originate from God. Instead, God has blessed us with a, with a spirit of power, a spirit of love and self-discipline. By shifting your mindset from fear or I can't to I'm recognizing these gifts that God and the Son gave me. I'm recognizing that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm recognizing that there's better. If I take these gifts and these words from God and implement them 24 hours a day into my life, with a smile, knowing that you're pleasing an almighty God, knowing that what you do is not for nothing, that what you do is for everything. It's the whole enchilada, man. It's all of it. Everything. But again, that's up to you. Last week we talked about God giving you a blessing. And then Cynthia and Kelsey Lane and I spoke about that when we got home. If God gives you a blessing... Do you think that you should just keep that blessing and go, whoo, God bless me? Or are you to take that blessing and expand on it? To even make that blessing bigger to please God with what He allowed you to have? Because trust me, He allowed you to have it. Your work ethic should be comparable and should actually success, be more significant than the blessing that you gave God. You should be so thankful that God put that right here in your hand that you're going to expand on it so you can help a multitude of people. Amen? Amen? Don't take a blessing for granted. Take that blessing and run with it. Change your life and then go change everybody else's life around you. But don't ever take God's Word or His Son's Word for granted because it will come back and get you in the end. Amen? One more, Austin. You guys can come. Jesus replied in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In this commandment, Jesus emphasized the importance of holy, loving God with every aspect of our being that we have, including the mind. Physically, mentally, emotionally. In your soul, in your heart, in your mind. Love God. Love God. If God talks to you, consider it an absolute blessing and honor. Because He doesn't talk to everybody. Because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. This implies a mindset centered around love for God. Make sure that today when you leave church, or while you're here at church, make sure you tell God you love Him. 
Make sure you tell God you appreciate everything He's done for your life. I know some people got some important events coming up soon. God's got you. Free and easy. Walk out free and clear. That's how we all should think every day. No matter what we're going through, God got it. But I'll tell you this too. If you want to make sure that God's got it. Remember three scriptures ago we talked about the heart? Make sure that this knows that after God gives it to you, you ain't messing it up again. Make sure this time when God gives it to you, path is straight and narrow, and you're going to reach other people, and you're going to change lives, and you're going to praise the holy God, and you're going to tell people that Jesus Christ was with you every step of the way. Amen? You're going to tell God, God, without you, I couldn't have done it. But with you, like it says, the impossible is possible with the mighty God. Everyone around you can say, nope, not happening. Everyone around you can say, it is absolutely impossible. You're coming across unscathed. They don't know the God that we do. We've got a pretty full church today. I don't think people thought that at first. You know, it's some crazy guy up here in a cowboy hat preaching. We got a great band. We preach pretty good. We have a great congregation, but we have a greater God. And we know the greater of this church is because of God. We know this church fills because of God. We know that everything in our lives that is good is because of God. And I want to emphasize something to you before I leave. I want you to understand something before I leave today. Everything that's bad in your life, everything that's bad in your life is because you've decided to do it your way. Don't blame God. Blame you. Look in that mirror and look at yourself. You may see what you want to see, but God sees who you truly are. God sees you from your heart. If you want this all to work out, if you want everything in your life to be better, if you want these blessings that that book that's called Holy offers, you have got to submit at all times to the will of God. And then when you get what you want, praise Him again at the doorstep for it. When you get what you want again, praise Him again at the doorstep. But don't ever forget to praise Him in private, and don't you dare ever forget to praise Him in public. Tell God multiple times a day how great He is. Tell Him multiple times a day how much you love Him. And tell Him multiple times a day how much you thank Him for everything that you've done, that He's done for your life. Amen? Amen. And the church said, one, two, three. Bunch of sissies. Like, Charlie, I couldn't hear a word came out of your mouth.